a weaving shed in Burnley, Lancashire, with one machine going. There are lots of machines there. They're all belt driven because they're all coming from a steam engine. This is before electric machines, and so the pa power is important here. Once you have power, then you can you don't need them all attached by belts to um, to a shaft. Yeah. So whether it's water or steam, you still need them to be built one on top of each other. So you need stories. You haven't got the kind of four di four disc production line. Uh, think about that. But before we go back into textiles, so we're doing textiles this week. Matt asked me a question about hearing me. There is an audio recording of this lecture, as there are of many lectures, and it's here. You click on here, so add edit feeds here. Let me just view it as a student, because so I think this is viewed as a, as a teacher. And so there they are. So last week's is here. If you click on that, uh, between your password and da 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 da, you'll see that. And you will see the PowerPoint slides and and you'll hear the audio of the lecture. So my lecture last week, PowerPoint slides and audio. You don't see us, okay? It's not that we're standing too far over to one side. There's no video, okay? The video comes straight from the computer, whatever's on here, okay? So you will see a YouTube link to a weaving shed in Lancashire, which is now a museum, but it was operating until the 1960s. While I'm talking about textiles, there was a series made in 1984 whose technical advisor was my predecessor, or one of my predecessors on the course, Les Hanna, who still teaches in, in, in the management department. The revisited element of the title was the original, I don't know, 45 minute, maybe one hour program was shown, and then uh, another half an hour was tacked on last year. Okay, so it's kind of updated. And the point is, there's one on cotton textile, so there's one on this week's lecture. There's one on shipbuilding, so that's another case study. There's one on coal. And there's one on chemicals. The ones that are underlined, we directly have a lecture on those by one of my predecessors. They're good, okay? They are, they're more qualitative economic history, if you like, because it's interviewing people who were in the industry in 1984. They're all dead, okay? So they're a, they're a valuable archive, and they're available in the course collection. Here, it took us quite a lot of effort to get this from the BBC, to get copies of this, and I checked last week how often they went out last year. They went out once to one user. They're good. They're better than this lecture. Cotton Textiles, it is about an hour and a half though, I think. And I, I watched Cotton Textiles and while I was on the train to Glasgow at the weekend, I did fall asleep, but I was very tired. But, but it was good. Uh, all the bits that I remember watching were good. The lecture will be, uh, so there'll be, like last week, there'll be a few facts, and then there'll be understanding success and then there'll be understanding de decline. Was it, was it inevitable? I noticed on my way here, last week I came with some books, this week I've come with less books, but I'm the only person I see carrying books. Actually, no, I've got the wrong lecture there. Probably doesn't matter. Strange that the teacher's the only one that carries books these days. So I, I never see students with books. Okay, the central points are very similar as we go through these case studies to the central points that we dealt with so these are kind of the bits to go home. I mean, you can almost leave now. Well, we'll wait until I've done this slide, but then you could leave now. Uh, again, we're thinking about productivity. So we're thinking about the chapter of Broadbury that's online. We're thinking about labour costs. We're thinking about transport costs. We're thinking about mass production techniques, some of which I, I talked about at the beginning. We're talking about standardised machines. Point of standardised machines is 19th century machines these machines you saw and heard running were all made by hand individually. They're all slightly different. So you need a skilled operator. You saw one woman operating one machine. She needs to be skilled because she needs to be, be doing running repairs. With standardised machines, you don't need that anymore. They're all the same. If a part fails, you put a part in from another machine. It's all the same. So standardised machines, delivered unit costs, including include transport. Now, we're looking at textiles this week. Last week we were looking at cars. Now, cars change, and it's relatively cheap to transport a car, and the technology in a car has changed. When we were looking into war period, you couldn't... Why did Ford be, build Dagenham? Because you couldn't cheaply and, and easily and efficiently export them, partly because they would rust between leaving America and arriving in a, in a port in Tilbury or, or Liverpool, as was. And in those days, you had to clean it. You needed a garage, 
You had a short warranty on a car, very short warranty. The warranty was null and void if it wasn't garaged. And if you didn't clean inside and outside of the vehicle every, every use, every use because of humidity, it would rust. So not so easy to transport then, but cotton textiles have always been pretty easy to transport. Okay, and with standardization, all that matters is unit costs. All that matters is unit costs. So where will the orders go? Okay, so almost you could leave now, because this is the whole point of the lecture. There'll just be a little bit of detail, a few frills to come. One of which being, Britain can't grow raw cotton. You've you're probably familiar with this concept, the sort of triangle of trade. We won't go into it here, you've come across it before. And yet cotton was the core of the Industrial Revolution. So on my train to Glasgow, amongst other things, I, I thought about cotton, thought about cotton textiles, thought about Lancashire as I went through Lancashire and thought about Glasgow, also part of the Industrial Revolution, also producing cotton. And while I was in Glasgow, I went to the Botanic Gardens. Now this variety of cotton, which is the most common form of cotton which produced this, this shirt was dead, okay? So at Botanic Gardens in Glasgow, the only one that was alive was this, which is a hardier ver variant of cotton, which still produces cotton co cloth, but they grow it in Europe, they grow this in Greece, and they made kind of rougher quality cotton, uh, cotton cloth with it. The one that produces this, we just can't, we can't keep alive. I believe Q can now keep them alive. Glasgow still fly them in on a weekly or bi-weekly basis and they can keep them alive that long. They, couldn't, they can't keep this alive. So despite the fact that we can't grow it, we were able to efficiently spin it. So this is, this is spinning cotton, this is a traditional cotton spinner, and this is, if you like, the, the British innovation of automated cotton spinning. This, this was the thing that captured, captured the world, if you like. And a child because mostly it was women and children and mostly it was sh it was it was children i wanted to show you another machine and bear in mind these machines are running constantly and it's constantly full of bits and pieces of cotton they need to be cleaned constantly otherwise they stop working and the only person that can get in and, and clean this loom needs to be a very small person hence children the industrial revolution was a revolution based on women and children. These were the people, people, with, people that were small and people with small hands. Okay, so whoever says Industrial Revolution says cotton. Eric Hobsbawm, the Marxist historian, also says it the other way around. The other way around kind of works, but maybe doesn't work quite as well. Whoever says cotton says Industrial Revolution. And as we look around the world, very often it has been textiles first, but not always. But this definitely works. Industrial Revolution in Britain was a revolution of, of cotton. So, and Britain pioneered the automation, the automation of cotton spinning and cotton weaving. And not just cotton. So a lot of the pre-mechanised machines came from the wool trade. So that's the other side of the Pennines. And I will show you a map in a minute of, of where I mean. So wool is the other side of the Pennines. Cotton is Lancashire. And, and then there's lots of other things where the same technology is applied. So jute in Dundee. And again, we don't grow jute here. Jute, jute came from Calcutta, this is the area around there, and then, was, and then was spun and woven and then sent back. Now it is all in Calcutta. The, the plat machines will come back to him, were shipped to Cal Calcutta where, it, where it's produced. And that's where it's done now. None is done. The innovation in Dundee, by the way, because we are talking textiles, was... You can't spin jute like you can spin cotton unless you add fat. And what fat they, they added was whale fat. So Dundee, again, Dundee was dominated by female workers and it was the centre of the whaling trade and the jute trade. But the cotton trade is concentrated in Lancashire where the first agglomeration economy develops, okay? You guys, you might not be interested in any of this, but you should be interested in agglomeration economies because that's why you're here. What's the agglomeration economy here in London and in the southeast of England? Why, uh, okay, I'll, I'll just leave that question for a minute, see if anyone answers it before answering it myself. Is, is there one? What's the main industry? What do you... Who, who, who has ambitions to go into the textile trade? Anyone? Who has ambitions to go into the financial service sector? 
So one person. Okay, so he's interested, two people. He's interested in agglomeration economies. Why are they all concentrated in, in the southeast of England, which is the most expensive place to rent office space and to live in, in Britain and possibly in Europe, even with a 20% devaluation of sterling. It's still quite expensive here, isn't it? It's expensive being a student. Once you're on your 60K or six figure salary working in the financial service sector, it won't matter. But at the moment, it's expensive. It's, ex it's a, the agglomeration economy of the service sector here. That's the point of it. Okay, so the first one, the first one is in Lancashire. And, we'll, and where is Lancashire? Lancashire is here. Okay, so my train to Glasgow went all the way up there, okay, through Lancashire on the west coast line, which is pretty grim, and I don't recommend it to anyone. But what are we talking? We're talking Liverpool, we're talking Manchester, and within Manchester we're talking Oldham, Bolton, Blackburn, Burnley, Preston. Is anyone from any of these places? Okay, brilliant. Okay, where are you from? You're from Liverpool, okay. Uh, anyone else? No, okay. Great, great to have someone from Liverpool. In Liverpool, they used to say it was, it was a city where it snowed every day. Why did they say that? Sorry? Lots of cotton floating around. Yeah, absolutely. Cotton is, though, carcinogenic, yeah? So breathing it in is not healthy. And we'll see pictures of cotton workers. Modern cotton workers wear masks. This is the dominance of Lancashire. And Lancashire cotton, Lancashire cotton alone employs more people than the car, the car industry does at its zenith. So it peaks at employing half a million people. Textiles generally employ over double that, again, at peak just before the First World War. And cotton output is massive, okay, output of a, of a million tons, which is enough to go to the moon and back eight times, and enough to clothe everyone in the world every year. Great Depression has an impact on on Lancashire. If I could just flick back again, when you're looking at data uh, as economic historians, you see other things, okay, as well as we're going to see the Great Depression in a minute. But what can we see here? Look at this, this huge dip here. Anyone, can anyone hazard a guess as to what that was? Over there. Uh, I know your name, but it's Matt. Matt, Matt, thank you, Matt. You've helped me a lot today. So, what have we got here, Matt? American Civil War. American Civil War, absolutely. Someone else, why is that significant here? Sorry? Did cotton go to America? Did cotton go to America? Someone else? America's exports of cotton. Raw cotton comes from America, absolutely. So supply of raw cotton is cut off during the American Civil War. Japan comes in uh, during the interwar period. A number of other things start happening in the interwar period. What else might happen in the interwar period? Think, I'm just looking at the clock, eight o'clock. Have I gone on too long? No, <laughs> not yet, I will. Okay, number, what else do we associate with the interwar period other than depression? A rise of Yeah, maybe. But I'm thinking generally politically. I was just going to say the rise of like other nations in the economic spectrum. Yeah, yeah. Rise of protectionism. Rise of protect protectionism, yeah, absolutely. That has an impact, a big impact. But I'm also thinking connected to rise of protectionism is nationalism, yeah? And nationalism has an impact on, on cotton and Lancashire. One nationalism particularly, Indian nationalism. India, at the peak of... Lancashire, 1913, is the biggest market, overwhelmingly the biggest market, okay? But, but Gandhi and Indian nationalism uh, have a kind of political embargo on British cotton, and this has a massive impact on what suddenly you lose your largest market. And you will, if you look at the stats in this book, you see this market, this massive market just completely evaporate. Nationalism has an impact on two, in two ways, maybe. So, but... Maybe people used to care about where their car came from, but no one really cares about where their pillows come from, where their sheets come from, where their cotton comes from. All you're interested in is, is Asda price, is Walmart, is what's the cheapest? And we'll come back to this. Okay, yet despite the Great Depression, cotton still remains Britain's biggest 
export. And it's an industry which, which is the dominant export industry for 125 years. That far exceeds anything else, almost anywhere else in the world, yeah, in, terms of its, in terms of its international global dominance. So we're now seeing the impact of Great Depression, tariff barriers, nationalism, and we're seeing a bigger impact on exports than on outputs. I mean, this become, the gap there becomes a big problem. But the, pro the other problem is no one is seeing it. Again, we need to put our historian's spectacles on because hindsight's a wonderful thing. It all looks irrelevant now. Why bother? But this guy in this book in 1928, was about the only person that saw it, yeah? Saw this coming, this position of dominance being over, history gone. So what, what, what were the primary causes of, of this? So Japan is a, is a key primary cause of this. And that is down to labour costs, okay? And standardised product, standardised production on standardised machinery. The question is... Come the end of the the end of the Second World War, would would Japan recover that position? And the assumptions aren't obvious. Okay, so who will export cotton goods? This is after the Second World War. This is the period that we're now interested in. Who will export cotton goods if Britain does not? Japan, America, who? Okay, so this is 19, 1944. And who do you think says this? Is it someone completely disconnected from the international economy? No, it's John Maynard Keynes that says this. So even Keynes it, you know, cannot see the writing on the wall that seems so obvious to us now. Yeah? Of course, cotton textile production will go to cheap labour markets. But even Keynes can't see it coming. But as we talked about it last week when we had Austins for dollars, do you remember the picture of, uh, of a truck with Austin Cambridge's leaving the Longbridge factory with the camouflage still on it from wool production? Critical thing is we didn't have money to buy food, and so and so Lancashire cotton, Lancashire cotton, still a significant producer, is bartered for wheat. The Attlee government, the Attlee government come in and they do see cotton Ex exports are obviously when you are uh, when you have si significant sovereign debt problems, any export is a, is is important. Yeah, you need to you either barter or generate foreign exchange somehow, and. In 1939, cotton was still our biggest export. So, you know, after the interlude of war, of course, the government is going to be looking to your biggest export to get out of the hole that Britain is in. So, this was a government slogan in 1945-46, so Britain's bread hangs on Lancashire's thread. And in this period, you can see something of a recovery, both in output and in exports. But we still have this huge gap between out output and exports. Over this period, though, you have British innovation. Yeah, Brit Britain's quite good at innovating things. One of which is rayon, and another of which is polyester. DuPont, America, comes up with nylon. So rayon is semi-artificial, so it's a wood-based product. And polyester is, is, a, is an oil-based product. If cotton, which has to be imported, can't do it anymore, maybe one of these British innovations can do it, yeah? And so there, maybe there is hope, okay? There is hope with technology for the cotton textile industry, because once it's produced, either, either rayon or polyester, you can treat it like cotton in the same way that jute, with a few innovations, could be treated like cotton. Spun and woven on the same machine. Spun, woven and knitted. So there are different ways of, once you have a synthetic fibre as opposed to wool or, or, or cotton, which is obviously short and it has to be spun together, you can then make it in long lengths, right? You're not restricted to one inch length, lengths like, like wool and, uh, and cotton, uh, which have to be spun to make longer lengths. There are problems, obviously, with treating polyester as a long length, though, and that is that uh, it gets very sweaty, and that was the problem with it early on. Later on, they made it in a long length, then chopped it up on into, into one-inch lengths, and then spun them together in the same way that you would wool or, or um, cotton, and then it becomes a much more pleasant fabric to wear.
And it's very commonly blended in everything that we wear. One of these, one of these synthetics will be, will be blended. I'll give you a break in a minute. Polyester invented in 1940 during the Second World War. Again, with problems with, problems with sourcing commodities uh, from overseas. Okay, maybe we'll, we'll have your one minute break now and then we'll talk about this relentless decline. Uh, I haven't got any more left. I, I've brought about 50. Um, I don't have a big idea. The of the fact, they, kind of they are online now. I, I, I put them online just before I came. Have you got the yeah, mic off? Yeah. <laughs> that, that might be quite useful. <laughs> Okay, we better go back to this. Uh, I keep looking at the clock. The clock is useless, though. Well, I think that's a minute. So I don't think the minute hand is even working. No. Nah. Okay, so relentless decline, very, very depressing. Between 1960 and 1980, a mill closes every day of the week. This is the point, though. There are lots of little mills. We'll come back to this. Lots of little mills doing specialised things. That's the point of the agglomeration economy. And by last year or the year before, there's only 20,000 people approximately still working in textiles generally, not in cotton. There's almost no one, maybe no one working in cotton. The industry just disappears so rapidly and yet no one's seeing it and just terminal decline. We'll just quickly flip through the reasons for its success, for its success. so the proximate causes of success and the underlying causes. Very high productivity which outweighs the effects of high labour costs. So there's sort of peak of the industry, Britain's labour costs compared to other producers. And it just doesn't seem to make sense to do it in Britain until you apply capital. And at that point, the unit costs are lower than anyone other than India and China. And India and China, at this stage, are not getting the same kind of profit margins because they're producing... A product that just isn't in the same price bracket. Poorer quality cloth. Bear in mind that Britain takes over as the global producer from India and China in textiles. And so maybe we're just seeing a brief interlude of production elsewhere when we, when we look at the Industrial Revolution. So why was productivity so high? Agglomeration again. Alfred Marshall on, on agglomeration. To get literal about that quote, there is something in the air in Lancashire, well, in the air and the earth, in terms of cotton production, and that is dampness. Okay, it rains all the time in, in Lancashire, and it's kind of horizontal rain, but also it has clay soil, and that, that doesn't absorb water very well, and so the air stays damp. If you, if you wash your jeans and then put them, your cotton jeans, and then put them in the tumble dryer for too long, and you take them out, you can't do anything with them, and that's what it's like producing cotton in a dry, in, or, or doing something with cotton textiles in a dry environment. Lancashire was perfect because it was damp. But that's not the reason, maybe the original reason why it was done there. The original reason why it was done there was one, it's near the Atlantic, uh, it's on the Atlantic coast, and two, um, it has water power. And then, and then it becomes steam engines and stuff like that. But, so anyway, productivity was higher. And productivity was higher than in other regions, okay? Now, some of these other regions are, as well as producing wool, they're producing cotton. Um, but Lancashire, because of its agglomeration economies, because of its environmental aspects, it, it's doing better. And it's doing better even in Britain, at the peak of Britain's dominance in that industry. So, why was productivity so high? Well, specialisation. Vertical spe specialisation spinners and weavers, and very few integrated firms. This is kind of like Chandler turned on his head. And a very, a very small tail, a very small amount of 
low productivity firms. Whereas America, that had large, large mills and large integrated mills, cotton went in one end, denims came out of the other end. That didn't happen in Lancashire. Not all in one factory. But America did have, it had huge capacity, but it had a large tail. Okay, so this is comparing New England and Lancashire. Uh, a lot of this is very dependent on Loinig. This is Loinig's field. Stephen Broadbury, Professor Broadbury, has two PhDs on his shelves. Neither of them are, are, are mine, but one of them is Loinig's. Loinig did this for his PhD. So uh, I've put that only just on, although it relates to an earlier period, I've put that article on, on the reading list just, just now, just about an hour ago. Okay, which compares US productivity with Lancashire, and it goes into some of these things that we're dealing with here. So what are the underlying causes? Well, competition. Competition between all of these different small niche market producers. Whereas the tail goes out of business in the UK, the, the tail stays in business in the US. And the, the, what does go out of business first is the non-Lancashire producers, the less efficient. So the, the, the producers that aren't part of this agglomeration economy. You'll see quite a lot of this in the video that I flagged up at the beginning of the lecture. Lancashire is home to many specialist pro producers. In 1910, British wages were six times Japanese wages. The agglomeration economies allowed the industry to prosper despite that, despite that huge uh, advantage in terms of low labour costs in Japan. British workers were manning more machines. They were 50% more, more efficient per machine. But today, British wages are 32 times those of China. We need some kind of technology to be able to compete with that. Can we survive that? Okay, so what did the industry do? What were the su suggestions of the industry? Well, implicitly, we've already brought that up. Chandler, integrated companies, economies of scale, Americanization. Frank Platt, who made textile machines, uh, he went to America and he saw these big integrated factories and he thought, this is the way, in the immediate post-war period, to make the industry work. But someone in, in the seminar today, when we were talking about cars, someone brought this up. And, and it's a good point, but maybe not for this period and not for cars. And that is that America has a homogenous market. I will stereotype really badly, but, but it's kind of jeans and lumberjack shirts. Whereas Europe is different on that point of jeans and lumberjack shirts, by the way. When you're looking at statistics on textiles, bear in mind now, cotton is so small in Britain that it's not an individual category. Through most of the 20th century, cotton was an individual category. Cotton production per pounds, tons of cotton produced in Britain. Now, it's not there, it's just part of textiles. But when you compare internationally cotton production, it is still compared by weight. Okay? And weight, a bit like when we were talking about nanos and Rolls Royces, units of output in terms of productivity. Weight isn't necessarily a good guy. There's a, a light, this isn't a Savile Row shirt, but for instance, it could be a Savile Row shirt, which is light, okay, light but expensive, high, with a high profit margin, compared to heavy denims, heavy lumberjack shirts, okay? So we're not, although the statistics appear to be comparing like with like productivities, when you're looking at Broadbury's productivity of US compared to UK in cotton, you're not com necessarily comparing like with like and you're not comparing profitability in terms of the end product. I do stereotype quite a bit there, but there is some reality, behind, like, like, like in most stereotypes perhaps. The government, the government comes in and introduces, introduces a re-equipment act to move along this kind of plat chandler route of large economies of scale integrated factories. And they offered, you know, what were then huge subsidies. But the industry, the industry know what they're doing. They, they don't take up the subsidies. Now, as some of you may know, I was a farmer. Uh, and European farmers, one thing we do very well is we take subsidies, yeah. And we take every subsidy going. Because we know that we can't, do, it, strangely <laughs> enough at the moment, commodity prices are high. We kind of could do it without them, even in Europe. But, um, but for most of, well, since BSE in the mid-1980s, you just couldn't do it in Europe without subsidies. You offer businessmen free money, and mostly they will take it. But they didn't take it. They could see that this wasn't the way. 
And again, in 1959, so another 10 years later, they try and do the same thing. Again, the take-up rate, if you looked at agricultural statistics and looked at the take-up rate, it would be 100%. So there is this common agricultural policy. You will not find a farmer that doesn't take them. Okay, so, but also America looked different because it was a protected market. There's always been this dichotomy in Lancashire. Uh, Lancashire is free trade. It's free trade partly because, I don't know, the second or third, third, third slide, this triangle of trade. Free trade has good side. It has a good side and it has a bad side. But... Lancashire knew that it had done very well out of free trade, very well indeed. So the idea of tariff barriers are controversial, okay? Although they, they would make sense, maybe, in the short term to protect the industry. Why doesn't the government act on, on Japan? Well, because they don't want another Treaty of Versailles. They want Japan in the Western camp and to recover. And Japan just takes over in the early... It's not China. In the, in, the post -war, in the immediate post-war period, it's Japan. Why wasn't it nationalised? OK, so the Attlee government came in and it nationalised... We'll be dealing with this next week. Uh, it nationalised everything that moved. Why didn't it nationalise the cotton industry? So the cotton industry looks different. And, and the unions lobbied for it at the end of the First World War, the end of the Second World War to a certain extent, and, and all the things that I've said about cotton textiles and employing women, okay, the idea was the state would take over and get rid of the women, so the men have a job. To a certain extent, if I was working in, in a cotton textile factory, either spinning or weaving, I would be happy to be removed. But, uh, but a job is a job. This doesn't happen either, but um, despite protection and despite integrated factories, long production, lot, long, long production runs, a homogenous market, America disappears as well. Okay, so Levi Strauss, made in the USA, this is a new label by the way, of imported fabric. Okay, so the cotton in the cotton textiles is not produced in America, um, and most of them aren't even stitched in America, and this particular product was. The other possibility, what's the other possibility? Integrated, large production runs, integrated producers like we, we subsequently get with like we subsequently get and who supply Marks and Spencers for a long period. But there is another way, isn't there? There is the, there's a kind of small niche market being close to the fashion industry, being being quick in the market with, with new and innovative innovative products. The kind of Italian way. The Italians and the Germans to a certain extent stay there for a little bit longer than Britain and America. But even they even they end up not producing yet, yeah? or just producing at the very top end of the market, producing the models that then go to China to be mass produced. The other, the other possibility was the modern fabrics, high tech fabrics. And this, this lasts for a while, but the reality of global economics undermines it. You can import stuff, all this stuff other than suits goes into a vac pack from China, yeah? a large polythene bag where the air is sucked out of, you can fit a lot of this, it weighs very little. So the transport cost is minimal. It's a penny a shirt or whatever it is. It doesn't matter. But we do produce a lot of plastic bottles because it doesn't make sense to import them from China. Yeah, because they take up a lot of space uh, and they're very, very cheap. Whereas a shirt, slightly more expensive, takes up no space at all um, and it's very, very light. So, but, and, and in inventing the fabrics, I come up with a newer example than rayon and polyester in a minute. Uh, inventing the fabrics makes very little difference. It makes a difference for a short time. It's like Cannondale aluminium bicycles. Or, subsequently, it, it will be carbon fibre bicycles. At the moment, they are still manufactured in Europe, but they, they won't be. So, initially, high-tech stuff is done at the centre. So, this Perseverance Mills that made this uh, Pertex fabrics this kind, of, this kind of outdoor clothing, okay? So, this was an innovative British invention in a British factory, in a British textile mill. Okay, but what happened to that? It shut down in 2005. Uh, the, pa the pattern was, uh, it's now student accommodation. Okay, so that's a sector that, that can't be done yet, maybe, in China. And the rights went to a Japanese com company, but not to produce in, J in Japan. The only thing that's left, what's left of the British textile industry? Well, a few years ago, 
It was airbags, okay? It was stuff that you relied on. Stuff which can be made cheaply, but you'd maybe rather it wasn't. You need this stuff to kind of work when it needs to work. In 2005, the Swedish airbag factory closed down. Uh, and production went not to China, though we didn't quite trust it to go that far, so it went to uh, Turkey and Spain. I'm sure they make airbags in, in China, I'm sure they're very good and they're just as good, but, but there is a kind of, kind of leap of faith thing. Uh, literally a leap of faith, parachutes. What do we still make in Britain? We make parachutes. They make parachutes in China. They make parachutes all over the world, but people tend to want the ones that are made locally. Partly there's a strategic thing. A lot soldiers don't really use parachutes anymore. It's a kind of leisure activity and maybe even a leisure activity in the army or a training activity. Parachutes in the military are used to slow aeroplanes down. And China isn't a big military ally of Britain, so there's a strategic element there. But there is a cost element. But if you're jumping out of an aeroplane or trying to slow a very expensive aeroplane down, do you want to save pennies on your parachute? Not only do we make the actual parachute here, a friend of my daughter's actually works in a parachute factory. I, I wouldn't trust him. I'd rather trust anyone else, anywhere else in the world than him. But uh, that's not how the consumers, purchasers of parachutes think. They want to play safe. Not only is the actual parachute made in the UK, the fabric is too, still, by one of the few remaining textile spinners and weavers. Um, it's not cotton, it's, a, it's a, obviously a synthetic fibre because it's stronger uh, and lighter and, and also has better uh, qualities in terms of humidity. And the other thing we make are, and William Reed are the producer of parachutes and, uh, and parachute cloth as well as spinnaker sails. Now I don't know if spinnaker sails, because they're the big ones on the front of a boat, are different to the mainsail. But anyway, they make spinnaker sails. They don't seem to make mainsails, but I think maybe mainsails are easier to produce. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But they produce fire-resistant uh, fabrics as well. Again, do you want to trust? When you purchase fire-resistant and uh, anti-ballistic, uh, um, when you're buying body armour or fire-resistant uh, fabrics, is your priority saving money? The, the few things that we still do are not about economics. That's my, my point. It's, uh, it's about safety. It's about, it's about insurance. It's about psychology. It's about military strategy. It's not about economics anymore. And that's, and that's kind of all that's left. And the last thing I wanted to say was, implicitly, I've been saying this all along, why? Why do we care? Few of the jobs in textiles are high-end. Very, very few of them. They are hugely unpleasant jobs that are dangerous to your health, dangerous to the environment, very, very noisy. You heard one machine going and, and poisonous. You get lung and, if you're a man, testicular cancer from spinning cotton. So why do we care? Now, to a certain extent, this is a question I'd like to refer back to the situation when the government was involved and the government was putting huge subsidies into retaining a cotton textile industry. Because at this period we had full employment. So if there was any time to get rid of the cotton industry, it was then. Because, the, because unlike subsequent recessions, unlike maybe this recession, there was somewhere else for unemployed people to go. There was, there was work elsewhere. So they, the government had an opportunity then which, which didn't exist as it slowly, slowly, this constant, continual, slow decline, there wasn't an alternative. And just to refer back to the opening slide, again, in terms of productivity, mass production techniques, standardised machines, and the delivered unit costs include transport. So standardisation is all that matters. And where are the orders going to go? other than for those few items that employ 20,000 people, so from 1.2 million down to 20,000. And that, as we've discussed, is not about economics anymore. It's about safety, insurance, psychology, and strategy, and not about the economics of the textile industry. Okay, thanks very much. Come back next week for nationalisation.